Hello and welcome back to Something Rotten, our season on The Last of Us Part 2. If you're listening to this episode, presumably you have played, or at least are ready to get spoiled, from the beginning of Abby's section, all the way to uh, the lovely Rat King that she finds in the hospital basement. That is the section that we're going to be talking about today, though honestly, probably some on either side as these discussions have go. Uh, joining me today is uh, a man with a voice like beautiful gravel, uh, Blake Hester. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> oh my god. Jacob, here's the thing. When one of your best friends in the entire world, Alex Stadnick, gets married, you go all out. You scream, you shout, you find yourself on the dance floor in suburban Minneapolis, just letting it all, <laughs> letting it all go. And I'm feeling it this morning. I'm curious if you can now do impressions uh, of, like, characters that you could not do oh, before. Like, like, could you be, like, Sid from Final Fantasy sixteen with your new gravelly voice? Um, I don't really know much about him, but I could maybe do Kratos. I could be like, boy, <laughs> do not be so Oh, that's good. Sorry. Be better. <laughs> um, no, I'm a wreck right now. That's You nailed I'm it. I'm a wreck right now. My voice is all shot. I'm having digestion problems, and I've been playing VR Skater, and so my arms are so sore that it kind of hurts to lift them sometimes. I'm I'm a shell of what I used to be. But anyway, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on your show. Long time, first time. <laughs> Um, and also joining us today, uh, is, is a a writer, former writer that Blake and I both very much like, uh, and currently a consultant and doing various other things, uh, Julie Muncy. Hello. Welcome to Something Rotten. Hello. I am thrilled to be here. I am a fan of both y'all and a fan of the podcast and a fan of horrible, violent video games. So. (laughs) Hell yeah. Thank you. On behalf of Violent Video Games, thank you so much. <laughs> as, as the as the spokespeople, um, Julie, I feel like when when The Last of Us Two came out, uh, there was a lot of writing about it. Uh, if if you can believe it, um, you wrote two pieces, at least two kind of like big pieces for publications um, that are probably like some of my maybe my two favorite pieces about the game at least that were published like on release you know i think a lot of this game has been coming to terms with it for like years after uh but reading your pieces again uh just you know yesterday i was like oh julie like knew what was going on uh from the beginning so uh we're we're just very glad to have you here thank you yeah that's exciting i reviewed this game on embargo which was a weird experience because i couldn't talk about abby i was like they kept they kept abby under raiden metal gear solid 2 levels of secrecy which is interesting you know i guess it was interesting at the time playing it and also even now retroactively looking back at it it's like i feel like in a lot of ways the abby section is what makes the game the uh, is the most interesting parts of this game and also kind of what make it special and make its whole narrative like pay off with its themes and to just willfully keep that away from everyone ultimately does feel like it backfired on them in some pretty profound ways. Not the least of which was just like reviews having to tiptoe around. It. Yeah, absolutely. I know. I remember like a few days before the plot of the game leaked on some forums Mm -hmm. and people vastly misinterpreted the information and it became a mess and it got worse when the game came out. It it was a whole thing. It is tough because I was, I was talking to, uh, to my partner, Annie, who's been watching me play through the whole thing about like the review situation and not being able to mention Abby. And it's like, you know, you, you do understand the impulse of them being like, you know, I I think it's a big and interesting moment when the game uh, suddenly goes from Seattle Day 3 to Seattle Day 1 and you kind of realize what it has in store for you. Like, I understand the impulse to not want that to be spoiled, um, but at the same time, I feel like it just speaks to what game reviews are forced to be, which is, like, a preview of the product you're going to buy and not, like, a holistic understanding of, of what the piece is doing as, like, a a piece of art or a piece of writing for sure um julie do you remember when you were reviewing this under embargo uh were you like 
were there people that you were discussing it with who were also reviewing it or were you totally like isolated while playing this gosh i don't remember i think i, w- I was pretty much on my own and might have exchanged a couple mm-hmm. messages with somebody else but it was mostly just me uh, i remember you know i didn't know this was happening you know i it was a Last of Us game. I thought it was going to be eight hours long. Not, th- I think. <laughs> yeah. I think. I think my first playthrough was thirty hours. Yep. And I was like, yep. so, so, when it got to the Abbey parts, I was both really interested and also like groaning internally, like, oh god, how long is this right. game going to go? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, that, that is a, a, one of the many ways that reviewing a game is weird and different than playing it. Is like it, your your experience had to also be like I have to do three times as much work as I thought I was going to have to do, like, just to get to Mm. the part where I can start writing. (laughs) Right. And I think also, like, if the embargo hadn't been there, if I'd been able to talk more about Abby and Lev and all of that, my review might have actually ended up being nicer. It might have sounded nicer, because, like, I could have talked more about the more interesting parts of the game. Yeah, it was a very strange situation. Um, So your review, uh, which uh, the, the... title on wired the headline is last of us part two is great but can't escape its father's shadow uh basically positions the game i think in this very clever way as like this is the daughter game you know if the last of us is the dad game and if bioshock infinite is the dad game and if the walking dead is the dad game you know this is this is kind of like the next step in that process which i think is both you know, really interesting talking about this game's structure and the characters that it features, but also kind of like a a weird thing to think about because like in the years since, have there been more daughter games or is this still kind of the one? Yeah, this is still kind of the one. Like in my review, I also position a couple other things like Dishonored 2 and even to a weird extent mm-hmm. near Automata as also being mm-hmm. daughter games. Mm-hmm. And it's a term no one else has ever used, despite the fact that I think it's genius. You should steal it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a very singular in sort of what it's trying to do. I guess, you know, you could maybe view like God of War Ragnarok, obviously has a son but it's like that game is arguably more about atreus than you know it's kind of doing a handoff but it it certainly still feels much more like a a two-hander than this where it's just like joel's out of the picture you know you're you're feeling his shadow throughout the whole game but like it is it is hard to say that ragnarok is like a sun game uh just because of how much it features kratos and kratos's feelings and kratos's motivations and all that wolfenstein young blood unfortunately that's a great answer but i wish that game was good (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. um so i think the daughter game is a good place to start with this because um the very first part of this section is like the i guess the second time you play as abby after the beginning is her uh exploring with her dad and I think this is kind of the worst part of the Abbey experience. And I'm curious what y'all uh, feel about it. Where it's the section where uh, you're running around as Abby and, oh my gosh, her dad uh, has found a zebra outside the uh, Salt Lake City Zoo. And then you find out that her dad is the only person that could develop a vaccine. And, oh man, Joel it, killed him. It does not dull. It doesn't dole out those moments well, I don't think. Like, if it had just ended with kind of the uh, the zebra jaunt and then flashed to present day and then done the Marlene and then the murder stuff later, I think it would have felt better paced. It feels like a rush of information in a way that is trying to, like, uh, be, I don't know, like, a little manipulative and how it's trying to, like, suddenly give you, like, all this empathy really quick so that, like, you won't turn the game off to play as Abby. It, it felt a little stunted to me. I also uh, am having... Do you have trouble finding where you're supposed to go in this game? 
because of the visual fidelity. Oh, sure. All the time. Uh, yeah, it, I ran. I ran around the bathrooms in this early section for so long until finally I realized how I was supposed to get around. And then I would get to the next area and I would just run around and be like, where's the fucking opening in the gate? Why does this game look so goddamn good? Uh, it took me forever <laughs> to get past this section. But I think overall, like, there's just too much going on here. Like, it is too jam-packed with shit to hit you in your feels so that you can, like, hit the ground running with Abby in the present day. And it's like, it's just, it's a bad pacing as far as I'm concerned. I don't know if that's what you're getting at, Jacob, but that's how I felt about it. Yeah, I think I, the feeling that I kind of had about it was um, essentially, uh, you know, like, a, an extension of Julie's review, which it feels like it's starting out Abby as the daughter of a father. You know, like, that's that's her role is like, hey, did you know that lady sure, who sure, killed sure. Joel also had a dad and stuff. And I actually, I think, you know, to to the story's benefit, Abby is not defined by her dad nearly as much as Ellie is defined by Joel. And I think that's really positive. But this this opening section feels like we're just like, we just have another one of these. We're just it's just playing another like daughter whose dad was killed. Right. Like it's it's throwing too much at you, right? Like I, I think it could have started with the dad still, but not had to like go through her entire story that whole time. Like you could have cut some of those dream sequences and dropped other you get what I'm saying? Like, it felt like that could have been truncated to not front load it so hard with dad stuff. Yeah, and the, 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 the Ellie section does a good job of sort of spacing reveals about her in her own backstory out, even to the very end of the game. And yeah, it's obviously they're trying to, you know, do sort of an experiment on the player, right? How far can we stretch your identification before it does or doesn't break? But it also feels like that they realize at some point, if they do that too hard, you're just going to stop playing. And so you got to feel really bad for Abby. you got to go back to the most emotional, sort of sentimental moment of the first game with, 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 with the zoo animals. Be like, remember how you felt? Feel a little bit of this about Abby, please, because we want you to play this we're begging you right i have a question about abby this is a something i wrote down in my notes is abby too quippy yes or no no she rocks dude no no not at all this is the fun this is the most fun section of the game and this is the these are the best characters of the game abby rules julie <laughs> yeah i mean i agree with that i, I think I think I can see the spirit of your question, which is that it's such a tonal shift, and the way the game handles, you know, its violence and all of that shifts tonally so sharply, that's like, why are we making jokes right now? Should we be making jokes right now? I thought the whole point is we shouldn't be making jokes right now. Like, I, I, I agree with you, Blake, Abby rules, but I do understand the question. I think to your point, Jacob, something I they're trying to do here or at least what i assume they're trying to do is we talked a lot about um in the first episode where naughty dog like completely takes away any warm feelings the player will have starting this game seeing joel and ellie together again and how that was kind of like a bold swing to just be like things fucking suck right now and these characters are not having a good time with each other the the actual like relationship you ostensibly would have wanted from this game out of joel and ellie you get from um Abby and Lev and Abby and the rest of, you know, her friends, which I actually think is pretty interesting that they hold a lot of that stuff until the character switch, mm -hmm. which I think is an intentional choice to make it more quippy and more lighthearted to not like pay off what the player wanted, but like kind of be planting those seeds of like, you know, like this person, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think I think my main problem with it is not a problem with Abby, but it is kind of like when you're playing an Audi dog game. You're kind of like, ah, Nathan Drake is a guy who talks to himself. That's just his character. He kind of talks enough that I believe it. And then you're playing Ellie, and you're like, okay, Ellie is just a woman who talks to herself. That's who she is. And then you get to Abby, and it's like, I guess every single person in this world just never shuts the fuck up when they're exploring. And I, <laughs> I don't think it's written poorly, but it is just that kind of thing of, like, it, it is going from, like, a point of characterization to just a law of the universe that everyone says what they're yeah. thinking <laughs> out loud. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you feel like, did you feel like the Abby sections were more fun immediately than the Ellie sections? Which, I think the Ellie sections are great, but for some reason, like, out the gate, 
I was like way more into engagements with Abby. I think it might be her loadout or just her play style. Um, but I am finding her just like an immensely fun character to just like fuck around the world with more so than Ellie. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Julie, I've been seeing you tweet about like how much fun you've been having with this game. So I'm very yeah. curious about yeah. your take. It's like, yeah, it's interesting when I reviewed the game, you know, I'm trying to put on my big thinking critic hat and write a statement mm. about it. When I'm playing it, I'm just like, well, fuck, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. This is really interesting B exploitation violence gaming. And another thing I noticed this time around, I didn't the last time I played is, and I don't think this is just in my head, Abby immediately you get more resources and your aiming model is more accurate because abby is you know a soldier unfortunately she's gone a little mm. full fascist in the interim but she, but you know she um she, i was just i was playing on hard and suddenly i was popping off headshots left and right when i couldn't hit a damn thing as elliot i'm like well well, well this feels great all of a sudden you know i did not even think about the change in aiming model but you're so right because i was just like shooting feels better as abby and i was like i guess it's the guns but i think it's that she can hold a gun straight uh, you know it's like ellie is very uh, i guess she's kind of like snake in the grass that's how that's how you kind of want to play her a lot of times is like very sneaky and abby just has such like literally and metaphorically like such punchy and impactful combat that like i'm constantly just running head first at dudes uh, pulling out all my explosives and everything like it is um it's it's interesting the things under the hood like you're talking about julie that complete make playing the character switch also feel completely different not just tonally like just their gameplay is like radically changed here when you when you unlock that abby momentum system that's when shit really gets yeah. going when you have the like once you've struck an enemy you have like five seconds to strike another enemy and yeah. suddenly you are just like bashing your way through waves of clickers or whatever good shit yeah you're playing god hand <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah one of the one of the like big the things that i remember from the first time of just like holy shit the, the, ellie has no idea is like waking up in that stadium and just getting that whole walk around and seeing like they have like a gym with electricity and they have like a cafeteria where they're like oh burritos again and i'm like ellie would skin a man alive for a burrito <laughs> <laughs> uh that section's really impressive i think that's like one of the cooler settlement ideas in the game is like this make how they've taken over a football stadium and made it like this massive community of thousands of people it's a really well thought out like post-apocalyptic idea for a city it's also um it's something that in that in that piece that we've referenced several times that talks about the kind of like uh israeli analogs or whatever to this this idea of like if they are this set up uh there should be no one suffering you know like they have they have like so many big walls around their like crops and whatever and as we find out it's like the wlf or who breaks truces you know it's like they are the ones who are kind of continuing the violence and so it's both it's both like damn they're so set up and also like what what's even the fucking point you know it's like you are bringing civilization back and you're like keeping it inside these walls because as as Julie, you pointed out, it's like they are they are super fashy yeah. just as as an organization. Yeah. yeah, it's like at the point at which you own a football stadium, why would you ever need to have the rest of Seattle? I think you're good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like why do you need to walk around and kill people? But also, like, what is the territory they're fighting over? Because the Seraphites are on like an island forever the fuck away from them. So the, like, actual territorial dispute is very muddy to me. It is weird. It's, like, in in this uh, Israeli metaphor, it's, like, the West Bank is, like, all of Seattle. Because they, yeah. are, they are in a stadium, and the Seraphites are on an island, and then it's, like, every building in the middle seems to be this kind of right. war zone. And, and we see, you know, like, the, the, the Seraphite kind of, like, bridges across things are very similar to kind of like how you know palestinian uh have like tunnels uh and whatever and so it's like 
yeah, it is this interesting thing where it's like, why why does anyone even want this place? You both seem kind of fine. Yeah. Also, when you got into Seattle, it's destroyed at this point by erosion. It's like, what are you going to get out of these? But I'm I'm picking I'm nitpicking at this point. But yeah, I understand. What you're- Blake, we all know December is the best month to give gifts. All right, Hotshot, what you get me then? Uh, the the warm glow of friendship uh you made me play anatomy there's no glow left Th- this is a dying star whatever this is it it's done jacob okay how about a lifetime nebula membership wait really a lifetime that's like 45 years that the, the clip at the clip i'm going <laughs> <laughs> Nebula has brought back lifetime memberships for the month of December, and now you can also give them to other people. Uh, the link is is slightly different for this. It's in the show's description. But uh, imagine, imagine it's the day before Christmas or the day before Hanukkah. I don't know when Hanukkah is. What? You don't have a gift. I, Hanukkah is a different date every year, Blake. Imagine that you you scramble, but then you buy your loved one a lifetime Nebula membership. Imagine the smile on their face when you tell them they can listen to every episode of Something Rotten early with tons of bonus episodes and no ads for, for their whole life. Now it just feels like you're being sarcastic. Blake, imagine the affection you'll be showered with when you tell them that they can watch exclusive videos from their favorite Nebula creators like me, Leo Vader, Patrick Willems, Philosophy Tube, and more. You including yourself in that list? Yep. You don't know who I hang out with. <laughs> I'm just going to buy a Nebula subscription for myself. I don't feel like you're being serious with me right now, Jacob Glenn. You can do that too. It's, it's 250 for a month, or you could treat yourself to a lifetime subscription. Okay. What, do you, what are you actually getting me? A smile? I'm tired of the modern world, Jacob. Oh, I can't wait to hear where this is going. Everything is just, like, designed to be cheap and break after one use. It's all plastic, and it all just kind of sucks, and I just end up throwing it away. Except for this one thing. Blake, if this is about Gundams... Except for these two things. (laughs) I'm talking about my Henson Razor, Jacob, the sponsor of this podcast. See, unlike everything else in my life, this is solid. It's metal. It's designed to stick around. And here's the wildest thing. Henson Shaving is also an aerospace parts manufacturer. I didn't know that until reading this strip right now. They're making and engineering their razors with the same kind of quality and precision. Do you know about the diving board problem, Jacob? I absolutely do not. So, all right, hear me out. So razor blades are like diving boards. They stick out further, they wiggle more. And this wiggle is what causes cuts and razor burn and all that stuff you don't want on your face or other parts. But Henson razors are so engineered, they only stick out 0.0013 inches, which means the blade doesn't wiggle at all, and so the shave is super smooth. The thing is like the stiffest diving board ever. This analogy, it works. <laughs> that's that's good. You're telling me it's good. It's good! <laughs> you can get one of these razors, which is also long-term and affordable and a sustainable way to shave, with a free box of blades by going to HensonShaving.com and using the promo code ROTTEN. Hey, free box of blades. That's pretty rotten, huh? Like, I have to tell you, Mm -hmm. I was just kidding about all those questions I asked. I have a Henson razor, and I love it. It's so nice. Hensonshaving.com. Promo code ROTTEN. Um, Here's another question in the stadium. How do we feel about the dog thing? Uh, I could take or leave this one. I like when you go to the hospital and you meet Bear. That's a wild moment to me, because you, like, literally do kill Bear. Uh, The dogs at the stadium mean nothing to me well i think i think you kill the other one too the one that you play fetch with i can't remember every dog i meet's name come on you meet a lot of dogs in the last of us part too <laughs> <laughs> yeah you do unfortunately meet a lot of dogs and yeah i i, I think that's again i th- while i'm not sympathetic to the people who lost their minds about yeah. abby i am sympathetic to people who bounced off of it because it really front loads the manipulation right it's like we want you to, to feel bad right at the start and then we can start telling abby's story i think that's a that's a great point and it's it's kind of weird to think about like i i, I think when a lot of reviews were like this game wants you to feel bad and that's kind of what what the point of the review was was like i already i don't need to be made to feel bad i think generally the things they were talking about were stuff like they make you play fetch with a dog you killed you know which feels so on the nose just like you did an evil thing and now feel bad about it and it's interesting to think about like if they had doled out the sympathy moments for abby at a slower pace would it feel less artificial or would just more people hate 
Abby still. Yeah. Or both. I, I think, like, it, I think the pacing of it could definitely be improved. I, the dog stuff is on the nose, but, like, I kind of like it. Like, dogs in other games are literally nothing the same as humans are. So I think them as an extension of the idea of, like, humanizing the characters or humanizing the enemies like is an interesting idea i do like that you could play fetch with the dog like it's it's goofy for sure but i don't think it's like i don't think it's tacky because it's on the nose or it's like bad because it's on the nose like i actually think it's kind of a fun inclusion to be like oh yeah like play with the dogs that ellie killed like i think it's a good extension of what they're doing throughout the rest of the game with the enemies um i'll tell you a part that i really like that is along similar lines not with dogs is when you go to that like medical camp after the beginning part where mel gets kind of grazed by a bullet and um and you just kind of walk into that like back tent and suddenly there are like 50 body bags and i don't think they I don't think they make explicit like that was Ellie, but you know, that is, that is immediately the thought in my head, at least is like, here's all the people that I killed two hours ago. I mean, you were the Seraphites, right? I think they do kind of, I do think they also lean towards like, this is from the war, but I think you're supposed to, yeah, I guess meant to believe there's kind of two things going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, I think they comment to the effect of, you know, this is more than Mm -hmm. usual. Yeah. Even considering what is happening out there. And the answer is you. You have happened out there, and it was a bad time. It's also about this point where, and I think this is like one of the interesting things The Last of Us Part 2 does with this Switch, where I am realizing how insignificant Ellie is to the overall story going on in Seattle, which I think is fascinating because when you're in it with Ellie, like you are in the fucking muck. Like her problems are your problems, and they're the biggest problem in the world. And when you're Abby, you don't know Ellie's there until the last 20 seconds of Abby's, like, Seattle section. And you realize, like, the overarching story, like, Ellie never comes up. And I think that's really fascinating to show, like, how insignificant (laughs) Ellie is to this whole thing. And obviously, she will become a much bigger problem for Abby later. But, like, I think that's awesome that they are not just, like, rivals the entire game and Abby isn't, like, hearing Ellie's there on day one and, like, trying to seek her out and shit. Yeah, and it it, it also just makes you kind of, I, I don't think this was ever the case, but playing this part of the game, I was kind of feeling like this could have been the game yeah you know like there you could have taken ellie out of the story almost completely had it just be about the wlf and the seraphites Mm. and and abby meets lev and like that could have been it because she is so detached from ellie and there's so many kind of this almost feels like the expected last of us to in just kind of like plot structure that you go to a new place and you encounter a new conflict rather than the ellie stuff which is just like dragging the fucking corpse of the first game behind it for the whole time yeah 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 yeah. for a few hours you know ellie's whole roaring rampage of revenge feels just like a weird fever dream it's like this horrible thing that happened and that you're not thinking about that much. And if you get invested in Abby and Lev, you can kind of almost forget it's happening. Totally. Yeah. I mean, like, I've played the game before, and even now I'm forgetting about Ellie. I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess I'll go back to her later. But I'm so much more invest, like, I'm so much more invested in Abby and Lev. And I think it's because, like, Ellie's story is, by design, I don't mean this as a slight pointless, right? Like, to her, it's everything, but to the world and to me as a human being, like, this shit does not matter. Like, she's a nightmare person. And yet Abby and Lev, like, they're, and Manny and Mel and Owen, like, these are characters with more personal stakes I'm invested in. And it's, like, it's easy to forget that, like, oh, I started this game, like, you know, so emotionally attached to Joel and Ellie because I kind of never want to go back to them at this point. Yeah, well, it's like Abby gets to experience growth. Yep. You know, Ab- Abby, like improves as a person Mm -hmm. she like learns empathy for others throughout her section and it's like what happens to ellie just a fucking slippery slide down to hell like she only gets worse and to be clear like i i assume we're all on the same page like i think this is the smart writing of the last of us is this discussion here is that like ellie's story fucking sucks and i feel like that's on purpose is like it's supposed to be um 
what's the word unsatisfying yeah absolutely and it positions abby in sort of not just this game but in the whole in the broader the last of us Mm. universe as one of the only people it feels like in the whole universe who's just at this point unambiguously trying to do the right thing whatever she can figure out that is and because it's the last of us universe the right thing is still horrifically fucking violent <laughs> yeah. but at least she's tr- but at least she's trying to help yeah. somebody it is interesting though the abby section and maybe this can lead us to talking a little bit about the like overarching story of the abby abby is um the specter of joel still hanging over her and her friend group where clearly that was uh more horrific than everyone wanted it to be. I think like people like Mel kind of thought that was going to be like, hey, we're going to go and we're going to kill this dude. And no one thought, hey, we're going to go torture this dude and like shoot his brother and beat up this teenage girl. Um, so there, it's interesting that that kind of hangs over the whole thing and colors a lot of interaction she has. Yeah, it is. It's interesting. And it also is, I don't know. It, 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 I feel there's a little bit of a conflict point with... Um, uh, I I really forgot almost everything about Isaac in this game. Uh, I forgot he was played by Jeffrey Wright uh, for uh, one. I was like, is that is that Jeffrey Wright's I didn't voice? Know that in the first place. indeed it is. Um, so that's funny. But also that um, he lives on top of a torture dungeon uh, that yeah. Abby has maybe participated in, and so it is this kind of like I. I agree with you in that I think it's really interesting that they're all fucked up over Joel still because when you first meet that group you almost imagine that this is what they do you know that they're like the inglorious bastards that they just come and like kill people and it it seems like that's not the case but at the same time they're part of an organization that just like routinely tortures people which i feel like is you know it's kind of like i i wonder how mel feels about that you know is she just kind of like well this is the way it's got to be or is she supportive or does she have doubts about the wlf i don't know yeah that's interesting and maybe a little narratively inconsistent because it feels like owen is actually the only one who is like i'm trying to get the fuck out of this fuck this and like mel has to be convinced yeah i do get the sense and it's not really clearly developed but i think there is a little bit of a sense that part of the reason abby and her friend group are sort of falling apart is that abby has gone a bit deeper into all of this than them both with joel and with wlf like abby doing the torturing but like mel i think probably doesn't go anywhere near that place yeah i want to talk about owen more this will be this will be skipping ahead a little and then we'll go backwards but owen is a really interesting character i mean blake you mentioned uh last last episode that owen was kind of like one of the only characters in this game who you were just or i think you just said like best character second best character second right? best character uh third best character but behind abby and lev in the whole game yeah, yeah. owen rocks um and dina fourth best character in the entire game behind <laughs> abby lev and dina yeah but the <laughs> point still stands yeah i love owen i think he's a really i mean he's a good um I don't know the word I'm looking for. He's a good answer to Abby. Like a lot of her most interesting character moments are with Owen or what while reckoning with Owen and her relationship. I think also like they have a really good um, love story, even though it is tragic and messy. I think like for a video game, they do have like a very interesting arc throughout their entire like romantic relationship. I still think like he's just a very well written funny character in the naughty dog way like he's quippy and a smart ass but like abby can be such a hard ass that like he softens her in such interesting ways that like the character really needs and lev does as well and abby as an entire character like her arc is about kind of softening until ellie hardens her right back up but i think owen does a good job in like breaking down abby the soldier into abby the human in a way that like this game like really benefits from julie you like owen i i don't like owen but i agree with you (laughs) owen annoys me and i think part of it is that you know i'm I'm, I'm very invested Mm -hmm. in ellie and dina and and he's just this bro ass guy (laughs) who admittedly is you know more sensitive and thoughtful than he lets on and has an important role but i'm not invested in him that's yeah just me me personally but i do think you know (laughs) everything you're saying is true i'm also just a bro ass guy so me and owen just two peas in a pod (laughs) but the difference is i like you 
thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think I think Owen is he's he is a a kind of testament to writing and acting because I think his role is pretty boring. Like I think I think as a character he is like pretty predictable, but like I think I think he delivers lines really really well. Yeah. Like I think that actor kind of makes things that I would not normally feel uh sympathetic about. I I I think he kind of he does it. I think it's cool that he kind of looks like an uncharted character yeah. but then does not necessarily act like one. Like he he is more thoughtful and more kind of uh introspective than he looks like drake's younger brother basically and he's he's like not that um he has in in basically his big speech where he says that he's like done with the wlf he talks about like um killing killing like an old guy and the old guy being like ready to die right. and him feeling kind of fucked up about that he says the line i don't want to fight over land i don't give a fuck about anymore um which is uh, again a another thing where the the israel metaphor just kind of really mm -hmm. jumped in my face for that because one of the um one of one of the points in that piece is like the whole cycle of violence narrative uh, only kind of works when, like, one side could decide to walk away. Mm. You know, that it's like, it's like, it's not actually a cycle if only one party has the power to leave it. You know, it's it's kind of assuming, like, an equal footing. And so hearing Owen talk about that, and I don't think this is necessarily, like, a a fault of the analogy, but it does remind you of, like, the WLF could just stop. You know, like, he doesn't give a fuck about it. The WLF probably as a whole shouldn't give a fuck about it because they have this whole football stadium. They could just go away. The Seraphites, it seems, did just stop, and then the WLF, like, didn't. And that's the reason that they're still in this whole thing. So I just, you know, when, when he was talking about control of land specifically, that really felt just kind of, like, politically... Uh, in step with with one of the kind of broad metaphors that this game is maybe intentionally and maybe kind of unintentionally making i mean how did how, like sorry to boil it down to a good or bad type question but how did you feel about it broadly because we've talked about how you like we we feel about other places this has come up in the game basically i felt like owen was a, a sympathetic israeli you know where where it's like if you heard someone in the idf say I don't want to fight over land. I don't give a fuck about anymore. You'd be like, "Hey, man, good. Don't. Yeah. Like the people you're with don't fucking suck. Yeah. So like, I'm glad you yeah, feel that stop. way. Mm -hmm. But it is still kind of a sympathizing with the oppressor. And just because we spend so much time with the WLF as opposed to like we only meet Lev and Yara essentially. Mm -hmm. Um we just get way more of their perspective than we do of the, you know, uh, oppressed group, quote unquote. Yeah. And I mean, this is the next episode of the game, but we will not partake in. Well, I guess you do go to their island and kill a bunch of them, but we will oh, yeah. see <laughs> you go. a massive siege on it while we're there, which is uh, a very troubling part of this game and hard to watch. It's just like this entire uh, village that this group is made is just burned to the ground boy <laughs> you're getting ahead of i know us. i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry <laughs> can't help it yeah i played the game before and it ruins my entire podcast pacing can i can i talk about something i learned with owen's character really quick his actor because yes. we were talking about we think the actor is good um one coincidentally from salt lake city utah where owen is from two the lead in uh, Risk Cutters, A Love Story, a movie that was very big for me when I was a kid. Do y'all remember this oh, movie? Oh, interesting. <laughs> Do y'all remember this movie? Oh, no. it's about a... Yeah, I'm I'm familiar. Okay. Yeah, he is. Uh, he plays the lead in it. Uh, Zaya? Zia? I don't remember how the character's name is pronounced, but that's Patrick Fugit who plays um, Owen. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I like that movie quite a bit, so it makes sense I like Owen so much. Here's um, last last thing about Owen. Mm -hmm. We got to talk about it. Uh, there's a sex scene in this game. Um, a good one? It's, I think. It, it is an interesting scene. Yeah. It's not as bad as most video game sex scenes in that it's uh, not embarrassing to watch. 
but it also I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I I made a face when you said it's not embarrassing to watch. <laughs> now, uh, d- Julie, what? How did you do? You cast your mind back to the first time you played this game, and suddenly the characters start taking their clothes off. What were you thinking? I, yeah, I mean, it makes sense narratively. I think I probably groaned. Mm. It's just, it's. I don't know. You know, credit where credit to do. It feels like what the characters would do in that moment. But also, I still don't think we've quite quite reached the, 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 the reached the point where like it doesn't just feel weird to watch pol- polygons it's, it's slammed bad. against each other it's that bad. way. Also, it I I think that this might just be a side effect of that. It looks like bad sex. Fair. You know, it looks like they're they're having fun. That's my biggest <laughs> question yeah. here. Is and and so so I was I was uh, playing this. Annie was watching. Uh, she was uh, fairly shocked that this happened. You know, I think. Uh, so basically, my question is: Is it weird because it's a video game, or is it weird intentionally? Because I do think, in a game about violence, it is fairly significant that the one like explicitly sexual act we see is pretty violent. You know that it it starts. It's not. It's not non-consensual, but it starts with a fight, and the just the way that the scene is blocked is not like loving. You know, it's very, it's very like harsh. And it, if you're imagining yourself in that situation, as Julie said, it doesn't seem like a great time necessarily. Yeah, because yeah, we ha- we have the sex scene between Ellie and Dina, but we don't see it. Mm. Yeah, and it's implied. It's it's off screen, and like the implication there is. It was this very beautiful, tender, oh, you know, Ellie and Dina, they care for each other so much. And, like, this does not seem like that. This really seems like they hate each other and they're not able to express things in words. You know, they don't they don't hate each other, but they kind of, they have very complicated feelings towards each other. I think that's kind of what makes it interesting. Okay, like, and, and to try to uh, backtrack a little bit, the moments of violence right before it leading up to a sex scene do make me a little uncomfortable. I don't think... Uh, the the preceding act before Owen and Abby have sex is them about to beat the shit out of each other. I think that's a weird look for this game to like run with. But I think like narratively them breaking sexual tension by having sex and it being an extramarital affair is like an interesting moment in this game. Like I don't think it's like this act of uh malice between each other, more like an act of exasperation that they've been like trying to smooth over at this point for what feels like years. Like, I think it's a good moment between these two. Yeah, and and I mean, I kind of, I don't want to, um, obviously what they're demonstrating is not a healthy relationship sure. that you would like yeah. to have between two people. I don't want to discount in this game that I think in general has a very interesting thoughts about violence. Like, I, I think it's an interesting move to do the kind of, like, they're fighting right before this and they do it because what we see clearly in Ellie and and definitely kind of implicitly in Abby is like they have a really hard time expressing emotions that are not violent. Yep. You know, that that just both of their both of their world views have been shaped towards like hurting other people. And so it just seems weird that like they can't she can't get to this point without first violence being in the picture somehow or and i don't know maybe i'm reading too much into this but like when you you talking about they kind of only understand hurting other people like she is hurting someone who's not really a close friend but like she is breaking she's a bit of a home wrecker in the moment like she is causing damage to someone else's relationship not through like physical violence but you know it it is a bit of like emotional violence in this moment that mel will uh, have a crazy scene with Abby, you know, an hour later with where she calls her out for it. Like, it, it does feel like an extension of the game's narrative or, or the game's themes in that way. Yeah, one of the sort of strange subplots of this section is Abby just kind of bumbling her way to ruining Mel's life. <laughs> yeah. Which I think I think doesn't actually, I don't think I've seen that scene yet. Uh, so it might be a little beyond where we are. No, it's before the Rat King. Yeah. Mel. Calls. It's no. It's, I think it's oh, right. Yeah. Where did you? Maybe. I don't know. It's all a little. A little okay. Jumbled. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's right after because it's after Yara's surgery. Yeah, did you like literally stop after you beat the Rat King? I'm I'm still in that garage. Oh, I walked out of the garage and <laughs> stopped. The cutscene at the end is when Mel confronts at. I'm sorry, I'm gonna. Okay, that's that. that's probably a smarter yeah, way of no. doing things. It doesn't. I hopefully <laughs> everyone who's playing this is somewhat familiar Look, with the story it, already. Jacob, it was a wonderful natural place to stop for the podcast. I'll say. Well, I didn't do it. Um, <laughs> Okay, so that's I, I I just I think that's a good conversation we had. I think I think Abby and Owen's relationship is fascinating. Um, but uh, anyway, let's talk about we've talked about the marketing uh, for both the first game and this game a lot. Mm. Do you remember? Yes, that one of the early trailers yes. for this was just the cutscene where Abby is being dragged through the trees mm -hmm. and uh, and gets hung, and then Lev and Yara show up. Yes. That was that was a trailer, was just that scene. Weird scene to have as a trailer. I remember the writing around that was I was I was uh, I have a very specific memory of coming home from a work trip, having to drive home and be watching this in a hotel, having heard the backlash of it and then like seeing what it was and being like one this is the thing we talk about the way uh gamers love to have mar violence marketed to them. We see a elbow shattered with a hammer you know live in front of millions of people it's kind of just a wild thing that in the moment in the game makes sense as a trailer it doesn't make sense but i remember the backlash very very specifically about this and the like op-eds that came out about um the things we talked about and i just mentioned like violence as a marketing tactic in video games and how it felt very tonally strange that this is how they were going to market this game and that was 2018 i believe 2017 Right. Julie, it seems possible you almost could have written about this. Like you, you, you had lots of stories about The Last of Us on Wired. Do you remember doing this? I don't think I wrote about it. No, I think I kind of steered clear mm. of the whole promotion because, like, I was in in the absence of The Last of Us Two. I was positive, but ultimately, like as time went on, more and more lukewarm about the original game. So, like, I was excited about the prospect of a game about Ellie. But I had no idea whether or not I was actually interested in it. And so I don't think I really wrote about it. But I do remember it being a huge thing. And like all of the promotion for that game, with the exception of of the, the you, you know, that big Sony presentation that I'm sure y'all have already talked about. That was the dance. Um, but um, the rest of it was like a series of snuff films. It was, yep. yeah, it's like absolutely horrifying yep. stuff. And they picked the single most violent and horrible moment in the entirety of Abby's section. Yeah, it's really and and the tough thing about it is it is an unbelievable scene. Yep. Just from like a blocking perspective, from kind of an acting perspective. Sing, like single shot too, which does is not super frequent in this game. Yeah, no, I think it is it it, it is showing off the game's kind of talent at doing filmic storytelling really well but just absent of context it is just like hey this lady screaming in pain as her arm breaks that's gonna make you want to buy this game right which <laughs> is just so weird and look here's the thing we talk about how much we love violent media all the time on the show as we said violence friend of the show but this shit fucking sucks as a marketing <laughs> tactic. Like, I'm, I'm so over this shit. Like, I know it's been like five or six years, but what about this from a trailer point of view is what makes The Last of Us interesting. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. what about this is like, this yeah. is what makes, you know, the fucking Neil Druckmann and Troy Baker love to get on Jeff Keighley's stage and talk about how important their games are. But this is what they show off. Like, this is the importance of The Last of Us. And it's like, it's fucking not. If your games are important, it's not because you break some poor woman's arm with a hammer. In the moment in the yeah. game, it is a good scene and it makes sense. And I understand why it's in here. But as a piece of, like, a co as a commercial, it is such a, fr I think, frankly, dumb choice. Then again, this game probably sold unbelievable amounts. So what do I know? But I hate it. In the sense... In the sense that acting, and especially acting in a video game, is like a technical skill, I honestly believe this is just a huge technical showcase for them. Sure. You know, it's like like the lights, the, graphics, the rain, the, the mocap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It all it all looks perfect, and so it's like you know, it, in 
in that I do think a big selling point for this game is the graphics. It's a, it's a good scene to pick, but uh, for every other reason, not a great scene to pick. We, uh, we can put this in the description of the video, but one of the articles I read at the time kind of coloring how I you know, felt about this section was Julia Alexander's piece for Polygon uh, headlined, Stop Using Extreme Violence to Sell Your Game, which something we talk about here so there you go. Uh, just the one last thing about that is that the violence in the last of us 2 is extremely interesting but because of its mm. context because of the thorny exactly. politics and the emotional stakes and how you're playing it just seeing it on its own is like jesus fucking christ <laughs> y'all why did you make this why is this here <laughs> exactly it is it is just uh, a thing that i have done which is going on youtube and writing like best final destination deaths or whatever yes, and then just seeing, yes, <laughs> seeing that except final destination doesn't really have any anything interesting to say about its violence other than like what if a roller coaster broke and that'd be fucked rolls. up um <laughs> though on the other hand this game did teach me what an impact fracture was or whatever that's called that yar has yeah um annie called that compartment, compartment fracture syndrome. yeah compartment compartment yeah. syndrome yeah. um Annie was like, because I had forgotten this plot point entirely. Annie was like, they're gonna have to amputate that arm, and I was like, what are you talking about? It's, it, it's still attached. It's just a broken bone. And then like two minutes later, Mel was like, we're gonna have to amputate that arm. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I, but they also explain why, which I thought was interesting, because all I remembered was her arm turns like blood red, and I was like. Why would that happen? That doesn't seem realistic. But the game goes out of its way to explain what's going on in her arm. Oh, no, it's a, it's a thing. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, when the, I have a very vivid memory of both times for review and, for, yeah. and now playing the game, pausing and Googling that <laughs> and being horrified to learn that. No, that's exactly yeah. right. God. Oh, God. No, Annie was Googling that and I was like, you better make sure image search is off right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. You do not want to see yeah. this. Um, all right. Well, uh, we're talking about Yara. Let's let's talk about Yara and Lev. Uh, they show up uh, for the first time in that uh, ridiculous, violent cutscene. Um, immediately, I think it is one of the coolest set pieces in the game which is just running through this rainy confusing forest and monsters are like jumping out of the trees uh great moment uh and then you find them and they are two seraphites on the run blake they cool you like so them cool. i mean yara's like kind of a non-character in the this game i think she is yeah unfortunately she is just a device that m propels the story forward Lev is awesome. Um, I mean, it, that's how, in my opinion, Lev rocks. I love the relationship between these two characters so much. Um, I think similar to Owen, Lev softens Abby in very interesting ways. And um, the way it leads on Lev not understanding the world is very fun to me. And the way Abby has to explain what the word cool means or the first time Lev says fuck, it's like everyone's like, yeah, they cussed. Um, yeah, I love Lev. Um, yeah, so there's there are parts of Lev's plotline that I don't want to talk about here just because they are in the back half. But, uh, Julie, the other article that you wrote uh, near release that uh, I really liked is headline, The trans narrative in The Last of Us Part Two is compelling. There's so much more to be done. So the, I think, outside the game, because I don't really know how much you would describe him this way in the game, but it's like Lev is a trans boy i mean he's he's 13 uh but he's he's running away because uh he shaved his head he wants to be called lev and not his you know like dead name um and uh and the seraphites are mad and do not want that and are you know basically hunting him down um and and it is you know it is <laughs> he is a trans character in the last of us part two which is a game full of pain and suffering and miserable things happening to people. And so I think I, I, this is this is part of what your article discusses, but I also am, you know, I might be getting this wrong, is like a lot of the discussion was kind of like they put a trans character in this game and all he gets to do is have horrible things happen to him, essentially. You know, that yeah. that's his character is defined by suffering and defined by suffering specifically because of his transness in a way where like, Ellie or Abby's suffering is not necessarily 
uh, specifically like because of their gender or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's really the sticking point. It was very, as you can imagine, there were a lot of very heated c- c- conversations about Lev and The Last of Us Two in the in, in, in the wake of its release. And yeah, I'm personally with the proviso, obviously, that I am not a trans man and can't speak to that experience. I find Lev really interesting. I think. Yeah, the, really, the debate is that, is it appropriate, desirable? What, is there Was there a way around, you know, Lev suffering being fully because he's trans? Because one point, I don't know if, I haven't read that piece in a long time, because it was very, very stressful to write and talk about. But um, uh, I don't know if I put it in the piece, but something that I've thought a lot about is that this is the world of The Last of Us, where everything is horrible violence where every single conflict that in the real world would be done you know with either sort of subtextual or systemic violence or with just words is done with guns so there's no way around being a protagonist in this game without fucking horrible shit happening to you but the, the question is just was it a step too far for the writing of the game to make Lev suffering so much about his gender? And I think that's entirely a personal and subjective question. I, you know, I connect to it a lot. I like shooting people who dead name Lev. I find that a lot sure. of fun. Yeah. Darkly. Um, and like, I think, I think Lev makes a lot of sense in the world and the context that he's in. But it's it's an uncomfortable thing for a lot of people and 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 and, 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 and for me to an extent as well well it does circle our back to something we've, we've talked about you know definitely last episode with the messy or inconsistent uh politics of the last of us world which posits itself as a post-racial world and yet like bigotry still exists so it kind of like Lev's storyline where transphobia obviously exists and is like the inciting incident of Lev's character gets mixed up into like kind of things we talked about with Philip Jacob well where it's like well how does racism not exist in this world but all this other bigotry does like it also feels like a step in that uh place where the game just is like kind of fumbling the bag a lot if that makes sense I don't know if I'm like saying this well but no I I I, I you're entirely right and it speaks to I think a difficulty that mm-hmm. if I was a writer of this game I would certainly run into which is like uh you know we talked about how it's kind of frustrating that uh essentially though all the black characters are written uh completely unracialized yep. you know that that like when we step outside the game we look and are like wow every black character in this game dies horribly and then the screen cuts to black like that's just the thing that keeps happening in the game none of them uh are even aware that they're black yep. it seems you know so like the in the game at least that race doesn't exist although we do meet uh a very horny latino man in this which is another you know not great aspect of representation well, and also less um, yeah. less problematically also like jesse acknowledges his culture right well, like i guess he says he's does he say it other than just joking that Ellie's i mean it's a joke to him but because like, he's asian but like I, what i'm saying is, is like black culture seems to just have like completely vanished in the 20 years since yeah. the apocalypse where it has not for others in ways that does not make sense here i acknowledge that it is a difficult thing that we are frustrated in part by lev's plot line because almost everything that he goes through is an aspect of trans suffering and we were also criticizing the game previously for uh writing characters in which their identity had nothing to do with uh the you know the things they went through uh except for kind of when you're when you're reading the game in our racialized world and so it's like i don't really have the answer you know i think that is it is it is a tough place to be and ultimately Again, not as a trans man, I, 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 you know, Lev is a great character, and it is, it, it does seem like the things that he goes through in this are, they are Last of Us style character growth, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but I, I guess I, I do agree with Julie that it is just kind of a subjective thing where I, I would not be mad at anyone for not wanting to sign up for a storyline essentially full of like a young trans boy suffering, you know, which is, 
which is a lot of what happens. But uh, here's the other thing. He's fucking funny and cool as hell. You know, like this section <laughs> yeah. specifically, it, you don't see a lot of him suffering. And what you see a lot more of him of is like being both unsure about the world but also like confident about the world in ways that abby isn't mm -hmm. which i think is really cool and and him i mean that fucking skyscraper section oh my god yeah. uh, we need to talk about that so just as a character i think that he is just a good character in ways that like i never wrote is lev too quippy because he speaks and he acts in a way that is really distinct and different from the other characters in ways that I like. Lev is, you know, infinitely more certain of who and what he is than Abby ever is. And that's really, really interesting. I also, I like the, I like kind of the positive religiosity, you know, that, that I, I think it's interesting that they did not, it would be easy to essentially be like, okay, Seraphites are any extreme religion and they're super you know like uh prejudiced or whatever and they like if you are this religion that means that you're going to hate uh you know non-conforming gender expression or whatever and instead lev is like no i still get like a lot out of this i like the the founder who's you know this this lady who wrote a lot of theory uh it seems and uh and like he's kind of like they're doing it wrong I am not, uh, which is, I, I like when storylines are not just like, religion is evil as a, you know, just in general, as a law of the world. Um, how about that skyscraper, though? I forgot that it was just a crane that collapsed. In my head, they had, which it, this doesn't make sense now that I'm going to say it out loud. In my head, they had built a literal bridge. I forgot it was just a skyscraper collapse that they make shift into a bridge, which is so cool. Uh, it rules. It does rule. Blake! I think I'm a person famous for having a beard, <laughs> but sometimes this is how you're going to start our sponsorship. Read. Sometimes it gets too much. You know, it can get scratchy. It can get out of hand. I mean, we're about to enter soup season, Blake. If I don't take care of this somehow, I'll be a mess. I'm not participating in this. You just say whatever it is you're going to say. But controlling my beard is easy because I have a Henson razor and I actually do love it. Henson sells premium safety razors made out of metal designed to never be thrown away and designed to use super cheap, super sharp standard razor blades. While the buy-in on Henson is higher than a cartridge razor you might get off the shelf, those costs flip pretty quickly. I've been using my Henson for a couple years now, and I'm still working through the box of blades that you can get free by going to hensonshaving.com and using the promo code ROTTEN. Okay, so the script says, uh, but how does it shave, Jacob? Thanks for asking, Blake. It shaves great. <laughs> These razors are constructed to have such an exact specification that the blade only sticks out a tiny, tiny bit, meaning it's actually really easy to shave and really hard to cut yourself. It's a good product. Okay, yeah, I do like them too. I have to admit, I also have to shave to get ready for soup season. Go to hensonshaving.com and use promo code ROTTEN to get a razor and a free box of 100 blades. It's soup season, baby. Or post a successful Nebula podcast so you get them for free. It's it's a great deal. That's right. Actually, that would save you money, listener. Do that instead. Julie, are you afraid of heights IRL? Um, yeah, yeah. Not to the extent that yeah. Abby is, but yes. Blake, how about you? No. I do. I I love I love heights. I have an anti fear of heights. So I was thinking during during earlier parts, I thought that Abby's fear of heights seemed a little gamified, mm -hmm. where you would look down and she'd just be like, "Ooh!" But this part, any reasonable person on Earth would be shitting themselves. <laughs> so I did not have to work that hard sure. to put myself in in her shoes there. Oh yeah, just that. It this makes that opening moment where it establishes that Abby is afraid of heights really corny in yeah. hindsight. It's like, oh, she, she, she looks over a hill and she's terrified. I wonder why that's so important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like they could have, it's like, I don't think you really need to establish that as a fear in order to make her clearly very scared here. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like, it's like making having a character comment that they're like scared of bears like 20 times before they fight a bear yeah. or it's like look i would also be right. scared you don't have to yeah. establish it um i do find that the balance system 
is kind of hard to read sometimes, and mm-hmm. my Abby just seemed to hurl herself off the side of that bridge oh, <laughs> more than once. <laughs> oh, no. No, no, no. It really killed the suspense of the moment. I was kind of disappointed. What about fighting through the buildings? My God, my favorite part. Yeah. When, you, when you're in that skyscraper and you look down and it's just like hollow and you can see like 20 floors below you, so fucking And you're cool. like, I gotta go through every one of these damn floors and kill all these damn infected. Yes. I like it. Yeah, it rips. Uh, the the infected that pop out of the walls get a little old in this section, though. That was that's probably the only part of the game where I don't take the time to loot everything. I'm just like, give me the fuck out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. No, yeah. thank you. I so I don't. I, I get just because I knew this section was coming and I played through it before. It didn't hit me the same way, but I do remember the first time I played this game, playing this level, and being fucking petrified. Like it. It was the Maybe one of the only, like, what feels like actual survival horror moments. Well, and I guess the Rat King section as well, but I'm including this here. But I remember being terrified of the uh, apartment complex here. Yeah, I um, I agree. It's so, it is just such a, like, different mm-hmm. location yep. than what we've seen before. I also think, we talked about in a previous episode that, like, as Ellie fighting the infected is not like the fun thing to do as ellie is fight people Mm -hmm. because fighting infected is kind of boring abby's kit is makes fighting infected fun in a way that it's not as ellie and like the the thing of like i don't know if ellie can do this but i certainly was doing it more as abby of like hitting a charging clicker in the head with like a pistol shot and then running up and like punching them Yep. is is so satisfying and obviously they give you a fucking flamethrower uh which is a uh, quite a weapon to have um it's just it, it is like a i wonder how intentional it was that's like you do more fighting infected uh as abby but i also just think it's way more fun in general yeah well she whoops ass which ellie doesn't as a character like abby's whole thing is she whoops whole ass and so it's awesome to yeah. run into a you could never run into a room of infected with ellie and you can with abby and feel like you can get the upper hand and it's very very satisfying yeah, abby can just tear them apart with her bare fucking <laughs> yeah, hands it rules. though also abby gets that crossbow that you can put a scope on and once you do that i was silently knocking out dudes like 80 feet away yeah. you know i i was just like scoping them out so i think in general I, I think fighting the Seraphites in this section is certainly not as electrifying as fighting them in that first part as Ellie when you're in the tall grass because they're kind of put in the mode of just we're going to walk around a big abandoned building the way that the combat encounters sometimes go here. And, like, I do kind of miss Ellie's traps and stuff at times like that. Now, hold on. The section, the, the Seraphite section... At the top of one of these buildings is awesome, where you're fighting through, like, two or three unfinished floors of the building, like, still in construction. That part's great just by the setting. Yeah, well, I think the, the the whole thing is great. Like, I really like the, like, challenge of... I get Okay, never mind. I misheard what you're saying. Yeah, that section rules. I, I, I agree. I just, like, you are doing more just, like, stopping and popping with Abby. You know, sure. it's like I would do more like scoping in with a rifle and shooting someone in the head, which is kind of a, a you know, m- more of a different video game than how I think of The Last of Us combat feeling. But maybe that's because they changed how the combat feels. I should add, though, I got to that Seraphite section with like literally one bullet, which made me have to be so creative, which was very fun that the game bent around that. One thing this game regularly does is it sort of exhausts you on purpose. It like at the point in which you expect to have a break, it escalates something. And so you get through all the zombies, you're like, "Fuck, all right. It's time for a little breather." And then you're f- and then you're fighting through a parking garage full of seraphites. Yeah. Um I think an interesting thing. I I thought about this. This is kind of it's going backward a little to the Owen conversation, but we also have well, we didn't talk about Abby's flashbacks kind of before where she has she has the one on the ferris wheel with owen Mm -hmm. and she has another one where they kind of uh, discover the aquarium and then she has this really interesting one where you think it is a flashback because it's her in the hospital that her dad was killed that joel killed her dad in uh and then it is in fact a nightmare um that happens 
you know, like, right after, uh, or th where she sees Lev and Yara, like, hanging. And it happens right after the sex scene. And I think there is this kind of interesting thing where, like, Abby almost has, like, intrusive thoughts mm -hmm. of death during intimacy. Because there's the other scene where Owen tries to kiss her, and she's like, I'm just thinking about Joel. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, in, in the aquarium. And I, I just thought that was... Uh, for whatever reason, my my notes are out of order, so I didn't mention that earlier. But I do think that it's it's like she she is not kind of obviously traumatized in the same way as Ellie, but I do think there are kind of subtle ways that they're uh, they're showing it. Anyway, uh, after you get out of the skyscraper, basically the next thing is going down into the fucking bowels of that hospital. Can I talk about how bad it is? Are we jumping into the Rat King? Yeah, I guess. I mean, there's some stuff, you know, you, you go into the hospital and you're like, hey, I'm Abby. I'm here on a, a job from Isaac. And then they arrest you. Yeah. And then uh, Nora breaks you out. Um, There's that girl that you talked to a couple times who's playing the PSP. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are the PS Vita yeah. that Ellie kills, which... I, we should just mention, because she's playing Hotline Miami, which is a very rotten game. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Blake, go on. Talk about the Rat King. Man, I was so stoked to get to this part of the game. And then it, when I played the game the first time, the Rat King fight was so hard. I spent so long running around this the bottom, popping and shooting. I took him down in um, 30 seconds with the flamethrower. Like, it was a non-problem. It was such a deflating moment for wow. me. Like, I, I'm just playing it on normal. All I did was once I got to the boss fight, I turned around. I was like, I got a flamethrower. Let me hit this dude. And I just bum rushed him with a flamethrower and he just dropped. And that was it. And then I had to kill one of his little dudes that popped off of him. And it, that was harder than the actual boss fight. I was so upset. Like, I was so looking forward to this moment. And it was over before it began. Well, um, uh, I would like to invite you to my experience okay. where I watched every single death animation that the Rat King had because I kept dying. Wow. Um, I truly, I mean, I hit him with a flamethrower. I, maybe I just had less fuel <laughs> than you, but it is, it, I enjoyed it, but it was certainly on the line of frustrating because it is just like, if it gets up to you, it is a one hit yep. kill. And so I watched Abby's neck get broke. Mm. I watched her arm torn mm. off. I watched her leg torn ah. off. Uh, so much shit. And I do, I do want to give it credit for like, hey man, they put an evil within monster in this yes, game. Sir. And I really liked it. Yeah. I wish I could have enjoyed it more. Julie, how was your experience with the Rat King? Uh, this time, I got through his first phase pretty quick. And then the second phase where the little dude splits off, that took me a while. Because I think I flamethrowered him through the first phase, and then I was out of flamethrower ammo. And I'm like, well, shit. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and so then there was a lot of running around in fear. I remember the first time I played it, on Embargo, it yeah. was a nightmare. Um, cause I, I was trying to go as fast as possible and I got, yeah, murdered every which way you could get murdered. This time it was a bit, it was a bit, it was a bit easier, but yeah. And the whole section is interesting cause it gets into sort of, it's not even a plot line of the games. It's more just kind of a thing that's happening in the side view is that the plague is getting weirder. And it's evolving in these bizarre ways. It's festering. Mm. Yeah. And like it's always fun to see a little bit of yep. that. I uh I killed this dude so quick that the guy that pops off of him for the second phase I had to kill. I only found later in the level after I killed the boss and was like looting. I was oh like, well that's that's how it works, uh, I think. Because you okay. crawl through the vent oh, right, and right, then right. it like okay, tackles okay, you, right? Right, 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 right. I see, I see, I see. But yeah, I Julie, I love that point because it's also uh you know, the interesting thing about this section is you're kind of in, you're not in, uh, like, point zero for the whole infection, mm -hmm. but you are for Seattle. You know, the plot is, like, here's where they took the first infected people, and it's just, like, they do a really good job of having a world that is completely destroyed and fucked, but then you get into a specific place, and you're like, oh, here is really fucked. <laughs> yeah. Like, this place is, like, much worse yeah. than everywhere else. And, like, the... I really like the kind of dread of like, okay, I'm going to turn on this generator now. That means that all these locked doors that I heard shit behind are going to open. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good section. And then that's, uh, I mean, you can, Blake, you can talk about the cutscene that happens after. That seems 
basically like a better place to stop than where I did. Yeah, I mean, you get the medical supplies. You're at the hospital to get medical supplies to take to Mel, who is, needs him to, you know, amputate Yara's arm. You get them there. All goes well. You spend the night at the aquarium. You wake up, and while overhearing an argument between Mel and her uh, Lev and Yara um, about Lev wanting to stay in Seattle, and, you know, Yara is now, they've been invited with Owen and Mel to go to Santa Barbara, where he has heard there is a Firefly settlement. They No one knows if it's true, but Owen... You know, clearly disenfranchised with the WLF is like, I'm fucking out of here. I cannot do this anymore. Um, as Abby's overhearing that, Mel walks out. They have a very awkward conversation where, you know, Mel's like, hey, surgery went well, blah, blah, blah. Why are you 11? You are fighting. This is why they want to go to Santa Barbara. Owen invited them. I'm also going. And Abby's like, oh, damn, you too? And she's like, yeah, not if you are. And Mel then just rips into abby uh calls her a piece of shit tells her all she does is ruin people's lives she says you need to get out of these kids lives because you're gonna just ruin their lives uh just destroys her and then it is clear though maybe not explicitly stated that mel is aware that uh owen had had an affair with abby two nights before three nights before um it is a uh, very very stressful scene watching Mel just uh, eviscerate Abby, who does not retaliate. You know, like she takes she takes her licks here. Uh, she takes it on the chin because she clearly knows she is in the wrong. And I'll say, I think it might be the only moment thus far we see Abby cry. She does actually cry in this moment, um, which is it feels weird to say like a huge moment for a character to show uh, to cry and show that emotion. But for Abby, who's like very she's a hard ass. Like, seeing her cry is not normal, despite everything that is happening to her. Uh, well, you see her cry when her dad dies, but nevertheless. Um, yeah, wild scene. And it is, it, what is really interesting is, you mentioned earlier that, like, Abby is one of the only characters that is trying to kind of unambiguously do, like, good. Yeah, Julie said uh, that. In it. Oh, Julie, yeah. And and um, uh, the fact that, kind of, kind of like Joel you kind of think of Abby as like a character who is maybe doing bad things and she's she's looking back at her life and being like, maybe I did not, do, you know, maybe the things that I did were not great and I should change. Um, I'm going to get better now. And then after, after she quote unquote gets better, there are people telling her, you're such a fucking piece of shit. And like part of her being better is like she has to just, except that they're right yeah. you know or or like like she you know her her and owen d hooked up after maybe abby was like i'm going to make a change in my life or whatever like it's yep i guess before but it's still it is like it is that interesting thing of seeing characters who hope you know that they are good or doing good in the world be confronted with evidence that they're not and just have to kind of take it on the chin hey and here's the thing as we said last episode one of the best stories about addiction of all time how it goes yeah that's i can see that and yeah it's interesting because that's the leap of taking it on mm. the chin of being like you know you're right i went way too goddamn far there is a leap that joel never really successfully makes Joel's gesture is always like, I did bad things, but for the right reasons, and that makes yeah. it okay. And Abby's like, no, that I I don't have any yeah. come back to that. That sucked. I'm going I'm just going to spend what time I have using yeah. the tools I have, which are her horrific violence, which is its own her conversation. Giant fucking to try biceps. To do, <laughs> right. To try to do something for once that yeah. doesn't mm. suck. Next episode, we're gonna finish the game. Oh lord! And man, oh god, there is have there's, fun. There's a lot that's <laughs> gonna go on between uh, this episode and next episode. Um, Julie, in the four years since this game came out, five, three, 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 when did it 2020. Come out? three, twenty twenty, twenty twenty. Sheesh. Um. Okay. Yeah. Gosh. Uh, three years since this game came out. Have you? I feel like the environment that it released in was just... I've spoken about how it was so hard to figure out how I felt about the game because of just how many people were talking about it in so many different ways. 
have has your relationship to this game changed yeah i would say it has it's like i don't disagree with anything that i wrote in that review it's still i think probably the game review i'm most proud of um but with that said my relationship with it now is more positive just because it's I'm at a place where I can look at the really fucked up politics and just the questionable representations and all of these really horrific things and and, and see that all of this is true, but there's something about the way the game thinks about violence and thinks about its characters that I think largely a lot of it is in spite of itself, or at least in spite of Neil Druckmann, um, that I find really compelling and that I can't quite get out from under my skin. And my opinion about The Last of Us 1 really hasn't changed. I'm only really interested in The Last of Us 1 at this point as a preamble to this. But yeah, but there's something about this that I just, I have to say I really unambiguously enjoy, even when I feel like my enjoyment should be a lot more ambiguous. Um, Blake, how are you feeling about playing the last section of this game? Uh, it's a lot of hours. I think it, technically might be the shortest section or a short or shorter section Feels like a lot um, happening that's making me think it's gonna it be a lot of hours you know we didn't even talk about so much happens in abby's day one it is almost unbelievable yeah like i kept being like we're still in day one yeah like the, when the, we're still there when the day two popped up i was like what the fuck i've been with abby for a month so, <laughs> right yeah we gotta go to california uh, we gotta burn a village down all kinds of crazy shit yeah the, the one thing i will say is that i played through this section for um mm. the podcast played up through this played th through a lot of the island and then i had to travel and i've come back and like and been like i don't I want to finish it, but I also don't want to yeah. finish it because there are parts of that last section that just make mm -hmm. me ill. You know? It's like the fun like, stuff I, is behind you. You already right. did all the cool fights. Yeah, and like the game's least defensible moments are tangled up with some of its more interesting all there yeah. at the end, and it's god, it's a lot. Have fun. We're about to uh, we're about to play through the worst tech and fight in video game history. <laughs> oh god, yes. Can't wait. Um. Well, everyone, stay tuned for that. Uh, Julie, I think most of your uh, most of your writing is is private now. We work together sometimes, which is really fun, and I really enjoy. Yeah. But uh, yeah. people people Same. don't get to read uh, what we write mm -hmm. that much. Um, we'll put your uh, the links to the articles that we talked about. Uh, at the bottom here but you want to tell people i don't know where they can follow you if nothing else yeah um for as long as it continues to exist you can follow me on the website formerly known as twitter um at julia muncie 23 i am also julia muncie on various other sundry social media on blue sky and co-hosts where i do very occasionally it's been like a year do occasionally write a little bit on co-host um and yeah i'm working on various fiction and other things that you may one day be able to read and i also do consulting that you can't read because the ndas are horrifying i would have to pay a million dollars <laughs> um but yeah yes that is where you can and can't find me <laughs> all right well thank you so much for being on the yeah, show uh truly truly a pleasure uh and until next time uh fear fights doesn't exist if you just don't look down everyone that's true bye <laughs>